Welcome everyone to a lecture on Friedrich August von Hayek. This is part of the Oikonomia Scholeida subsection on the history of economic theory, which we also need to study, just as we have to study monetary history and the philosophy of money, of which there has not been written enough, in order to be able to draw what is what we can require, what we need from economic theory for our new economy. The economist called Friedrich August von Hayek the Viennese apostle of the free market. And he theorized and published not only in the fields of economics, but also political philosophy, legal architecture and theory, theoretical psychology, and, of course, um, Hayek, Austrian economics more broadly, is now enjoying again growing popularity amongst Bitcoiners and libertarians. In 2010, his book Road to Serfdom became the Bible of the Tea Party movement, a movement that's now forgotten. But he, I think he's coming back through the... Um, through the Bitcoin movement. And um, there are certain extremely important ideas when it comes to information, etc., in Hayek that we need to heed. And of course, also the discussion on neoliberalism. Um, he is the intellectual father of neoliberalism. So either he's the advocate of the devil for some or the advocate of liberty. Of course, it's, yeah, the question is how does he understand freedom? so-called um, neoconservatives or whatever's left of them in 1999 called them a prophet of the modern world. This is published in the Washington Times. And there are think tanks in America, like the K2 Institute, the American Enterprise Institute, which vouch for a libertarian society who see Hayek also as one of their most important supporters and prophets even. And also academically, Hayek um, is not entirely unimportant. He was um, highly influential on Milton Friedman and um, the age of Hayek. Um, so Milton Friedman said that the age of Keynes was 1950s to 70s, but the rest of the 20th century was the age of Hayek. Of course, that's also debatable because Keynesianism supposedly, as some would claim, is now at the heart of what central banks are pursuing worldwide. But that in itself is a question whether that's properly Keynes or not. The debate between Keynes and Hayek, which started in the 1930s, still continues today, um, led by their respective disciples. Importantly though, they stand on completely different planes philosophically. Keynes is a Cartesian. Hayek is a child of the Scottish enlightenment. Hayek, for example, is one of the most uh, also important uh, political scientists, not just economists of the 20th century. Um, in an article in the New York Times, Kenneth Minogue from 2000, um, Minogue goes even as far as to call Hayek, quote, undoubtedly the man for the century ahead of us. So for the 21st century, Hayek is the man, the economist, the thinker to consider. So maybe that's a bit too far-fetched. However, it's certain to say that Hayek is of continuing relevance, first and foremost, in his role as a controversial political economist and philosopher. Profit or not, Hayek's substantial output in all sorts of scientific disciplines has attracted a considerable body of scholars debating his theories. His disciples take Hayek's words as written in stone truth often, and while its critics oppose his theories as fundamentally flawed at best. So there's very rarely any middle ground. So what I'll try to do here and going forward when I put out more on Hayek and others is to show his genuine contributions to science, and but also the weaknesses and contradictions and inconsistencies in his account of the liberal order. I understand liberal order as an 
non-theological or non-teleological or ateleological process in the sense that on the macro level a rigid common objective is not pursued which would hinder individuals in their private interests. Order is found on the economic level through compromise-based bargaining on multiple variations of markets and on the social and political level through constant discourse and exchange of opinions. Individuals are viewed as multidimensional. This means that individuals live on several levels too. That means to say, for example, in the network of a family and on a higher scale in civil society as conscious members of their environment. They may be part of different communities simultaneously while engaging in their private activities. They are not one dimensional in the sense that they are not simply out, for example, to maximize utility and they are not one dimensional in the sense of just belonging to one certain group or class, that's the liberal idea or ideal. Their life is thus not to turn merely by the rules of the market and the tradition of liberalism, John Stuart Mill is generally regarded as having explicitly formulated such an approach. And also Adam Smith perhaps viewed human being as a multidimensional being. Despite the existence of overall political goals of the state set in the constitution, etc., private ends are open, individuals can decide on their desired paths of life. A superficial interpretation of Hayek's work would assume his support of this definition, while a thorough reading of his text rather demands to view Hayek's form of liberalism as rigidly principled and strongly theological. There is a telos, that's the great society in Hayek, that he's really writing towards, and it's a telos that's posited before. Um, and it has to do with the inherent contradictions of the so-called open society as well that Popper proclaimed and propagated. Principled, I say, because individuals do not engage political affairs and living together does not require compromise or even only discussion about the guiding principles. Hayek makes this very clear. Um, is so they're principled is it's not open-ended actually so there are there's a definite set of laws governing everything but this is only implicit you can find in Hayek I think and the telos is I just mentioned before the great society which is always capitalized in Hayek which spontaneously is governed spontaneously by natural principles in fact the thesis will argue in the, this is my thesis that I have, um, that Hayek envisions a utopian society, a liberal ideal state, based on his Panglossian evolutionary theory. Dr. Pangloss in uh, Voltaire's Condit should be known to everyone. Dr. Pangloss is a Leibnizian who walks around um, the world and says, this is all just wonderful. Um, the, the 10,000 of our best men have died. So uh, he rationalizes anything that happens. Of course, a complete misunderstanding of Leibniz, but that's besides the point. This is how Voltaire misunderstood um, Leibniz. And Hayek is a Panglossian. So the, he's a rationalistic optimist that it's his evolutionary theory, um, which is itself no longer Darwinian, not non-teleological, non but has a very specific telos, that is the great society. So um, Hodgson notes the following. Quote, while Hayek's warnings about the dangers of proposals to plan an entire society in some rational way remain pertinent, he himself slips back into the constructivist project to build a liberal order whose broad features are themselves decreed by reason, end of quote. And I would say, though, that this is itself at the heart of the issue of, of, of liberalism. Is that liberalism is itself not free from what it procl proclaims to be free. As Hayek himself stressed the importance of a thinker's epistemological background when interpreting its, his theories, the thesis here that I put forth, uh, I attempt to be uh, showing um, uh, that high, how Hayek's you know, mind works um, uh, in, in the sense that um, 
we need to look at his his roots in Scottish Enlightenment, of course, also his roots in Austrian economics, um, to see why there is in Hayek this neoliberal um, project coming to the fore and what this kind of a society that he envisions would look like. Um, so important figures for Hayek, just to mention their names are Knut Wichsel, Karl Menger, and of course Ludwig von Mises. And there's in America the von Mises Institute also. Uh, so Austrian economics is very popular in America, not so much in in Europe anymore. Um, Hayek's theory of mind um, is also crucial. He had, so you can see how in the many forays that this uh, man uh, delved into. And most importantly, perhaps, um, Hayek did advertise or argue in favor of the privatization of money. And we can see again with Bitcoin uh, etc um with the, with the cryptos um, at least the the possibility of a world in which currency is largely or to a large extent private or at least uh, but of course you know um what's what's private can also very easily slip into neo feudalism so it's um one has to be careful with being all too optimistic about these things. So Hayek's great society, I think, is Hayek's ideal state. And that's, of course, baffling to claim because an ideal state or utopia, and just to mention this in passing, Mussolini published a magazine of the same name, is, of course, a planned or designed organization, if one regards Plato's Republic as the first description of an ideal society. Thomas More's Utopia, the island with the perfect social political system, um, is of course the origin for any modern theory of social utopia. Um, but uh, of course, this kind of utopia in Thomas More, there is no private property. That's not the case for Hayek. So Hayek understood utopia in regard to More's book. Uh, and set out against any such forms of what he would consider communism. But he himself arrives as again in a utopian ideal state because he describes the world as it ought to be or to become. In the context of this discussion, um, Hayek make a, makes a distinction between taxes, order, artificially made, and cosmos, which he understands as naturally grown order, which for him is good order. And however, I think that um, Hayek comes up himself with a taxis rather than a cosmos. And in his later life, um, Hayek even showed contempt for the word economy. And that's also important uh, for also this project of oikonomia scolea. Um, he pre Hayek preferred the notion of katalaxi, following his mentor Mises. Um, which described the economic functioning of the great society. Because the notion of economia would allow for a leader of the household, as um, Aristotle says, oikonomia monarchia est, the economy is a monarchy. So uh, the catalaxy is, the, um, is clearly the attempt to find a term where there is no leadership but... Um, so th th there is no common, um, th th there is a spontaneous order that comes about in Catalaxi. Um, and it, there's no household management, as it were, to use the um, ordinary um, definition of economy. Of course, we understand here oikonomia as the nomos which is in tune with the cosmos that grounds a house, which is the dwelling ground of human beings as mortals and finite beings. So, um, Hayek understood the great society as anti-utopian in a strict sense, but it is 
to my mind, um, utopian. Um, so there is a distinct understanding of Hayek's liberalism that comes to the fore here. But at the same time, there's not just a reinvention of classical liberalism, but perhaps something that about li liberalism itself uh, that comes to the foreground um, that comes to the foreground thanks to Hayek um, and his rebirth or his attempt at constructing a great society. And um, of course, we also have to delve into, one has to mention that um, what's ignored in Hayek is sympathy um, and to a certain degree egalitarianism that's ignored in him um, but others have argued that there's a false dichotomy between liberalism and collectivism so it's you can see that the great society is a very strange um, approach to uh, to 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 organizing a society it's a society without a society of course one would have to say why do we have at all this um, this uh, this ratification of human life or human community as a society which then is either planned or left to its own devices but within a certain framework in a night to watch a state etc um, but I think in high we can we can uh, analyze and diagnose something about liberalism itself um, and and then try and move over and beyond it and its many ramifications. So, um, however, what one should perhaps also mention is that uh, not just the privatization of money, which Hayek was very, um, one of the first to say this again in the 20th century, but also his, his work on information theory, whatever you think of information, um, Hayek was aware that um, there can be asymmetries in information and um, those who are aware of the asymmetries will be able to capitalize on those. So in the coming months there will be more on economic theory, on the history of economic theory but there will also be different attempts at articulating our own ways of um, uh, of founding a, a, an economy for our epoch that um, does not turn us into debt slaves, etc. But is ultimately liberating, but at the same time free from all the overcome ideologies. And if you're interested in Hayek and Austrian economics, etc., and liberalism, neoliberalism. Just follow the link down below. There will be a course on Hayek at some point, probably next year. So feel free to submit your interest now and we'll be in touch as soon as we know more about the course. Thank you very much.